Welcome to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito, the show that explores how to build up or break down any relationship with confidence, clarity, and compassion. I'm very excited today to be speaking with Dr. Duana Welch. Dr. Welch is an author of the well-known book, Love Factually. She's a dating coach. She's a professor. She's somebody who guides clients as they navigate the online dating world. The interesting thing about Duana's work and the unusual thing is she relies upon science, not opinion, to help people find each other. And I plan that this conversation will be the first in a series of discussions about love. We want to talk about what we've been told about love versus what it actually is and what makes it work. But before Duane and I talk about her groundbreaking research, you should know that I was introduced to Duane's work earlier this year. And after reaching out to her thinking, well, we're both in the relationship business, we should talk. We began a series of what I perceived, and I hope she did, fascinating discussions about our respective work in the relationship business and about our lives. And I was really drawn to her theories not just because of what she wrote and how she spoke, because she walked the walk. She was vulnerable and transparent, and you'll find her to be so today. And that inspired me because authenticity matters, especially when you're talking about matters of the heart. Duana, I've shared with you that your unique perspective has certainly changed the way I see dating and the way I see relationships in love. Thank you so much. It's just such a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to every one of our conversations. So, Duana, in your book, you have all these steps and guidelines to finding and keeping love. Doesn't real love, I mean, true love, just find us? You know about the law of attraction that says if we just, you know, envision what we want, it'll happen. That is not true or else, you know, everybody would be healthy, wealthy and wise, right? But isn't that what we grow up thinking? I mean, we grow up, especially as young girls, thinking that this magical moment's going to happen and the rest, you know, love will take care of. Well, yeah, that's another myth is that we don't have to look. You know, there's a word for people who stop looking or don't look to begin with, and that word is single. I was unexpectedly single uh, a couple years ago. I love that phrase, by the way, unexpectedly single. (laughs) It's a great phrase. I'm going to use that. Yeah, (laughs) unexpectedly single a couple years ago. And I was taking a walk in my neighborhood. And, you know, people around here know what I do. And a woman who's about my age came out in her front yard. We were talking, of course, socially distanced because it's right in the middle of the pandemic. And she said, you know, I hope you won't look because if you look, that'll keep it from happening. That's one of the mating myths that if I want it badly or if I actively search that I'm going to ruin my odds. It's kind of like, you know, when you go into a house with a cat, if you don't look at the cat, the cat will come to you. People think that about love. Right. They do. They think, you know, you're magically somebody's going to appear. And that's why people are so uncomfortable about online dating, but people don't know what they're looking for. Discomfort with online dating is its very own thing. Discomfort with looking at all. You may have a friend who ran into his or her future mate in a coffee shop and they just struck up a conversation and they couldn't stop talking and they realized we need to see each other again. They wound up happily married, but it's not the way to bet. Science shows the odds of an event happening. It doesn't show the certainty. So we know, for example, that six out of 10 smokers die from smoking. That's what kills them is a cancer related to smoking. But it's not 100% of them, and we don't know which six people it'll be. So when I'm talking about odds during any of our podcasts, what I'm saying is, here's what happens to most people most of the time. Here's how to hedge your bets. I wouldn't buy a car if the salesperson said, you know, this is a great car, but six out of 10 people unfortunately die in a fiery explosion. Uh, Okay, show me something else. So when I tell you about the odds, the odds are very high that you're not going to accidentally meet your future mate once you are past about 25 or so. So how do you increase those? How do you identify what you're looking for? Are there tools that you recommend that we use to help us identify who we're looking for? Absolutely. And I want to answer the question to begin with, with a rhetorical question, which is, if you were going to take a vacation, would you get in your car with no GPS, no maps, and start driving and just hope you end up where you think you're going to end up? Nobody would do that, but we do it in love all the time. 
I want you all to have a roadmap to take you where you want to go. And this is not magical thinking. I'm not saying if you make this list, the right person will appear. But if you make this list, you will stop wasting time in dead end relationships. You'll know more readily when you're encountering someone who doesn't match your list. And you'll know when you meet somebody who has. And what's really wonderful is every now and then I will get an engagement announcement or wedding photos from someone who said, I made the list and I realized that my person was at my workplace and we've talked for years and I didn't realize, oh, that's the one. This so so in one. your book, you refer to this as your desired traits list. And, yeah, it's and your and traits you are very nice. specific about directing people to write down what is required and, and not to deviate from that. Right. Seems a little clinical. Okay. So one of the questions I frequently get asked by my clients is, so do you do all this stuff? And of course I do everything that I teach other people to do because science, it works. And as you also know, I got in a really happy relationship almost a year ago and I used all of this in order to do it. And I'm now 53. So, you know, most people wouldn't consider those the salad days for women looking for a partner. These strategies work. The most important work I do with clients perhaps is making this list. And it is very specific. I ask people for First, to just brainstorm absolutely everything they can think of that they want or need in a partner. And some people don't really know. So what I say is think about all your past relationships and the things that you did and didn't like and put that on your list. And don't say to yourself, well, I can't have that. Or am I being realistic? Or, you know, there aren't enough people like that in the world. Just write it all down. And it might initially start with doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, doesn't put down his mother when he talks, whatever. It might be negative at first, but I have people write down everything. And then I have them go back through the list and make it all positive. So instead of doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, it could be abstains from use of legal or illegal substances for recreational purposes. Why do you think it's important to put it in a positive uh, spin as opposed to a uh, negative? Don't think about the white polar bear. You're thinking about the white polar bear right now, aren't right, you? Right, got it. So our brain fails to process the word not, not a smoker. Now who are you looking for? A smoker. What's happening with this list is you are doing something that is known scientifically as priming. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but maybe if you've heard a phrase in a movie and you catch yourself saying that same phrase a couple days later and you think, I've never said that before, and you didn't really intend to say it, that's because your brain was primed. You have neural connections that grow and that are more likely to be activated if you've encountered the information recently. You know, it's fun as I've never said this on a podcast before. So I went through this exercise and I spoke with you about it and it was shocking to me the things that I actually had to admit were important to me when I wrote them down. You know, they're the kind of things you think about, but you don't want to really admit are all that important. They are. And going through this exercise really helped me narrow my span of people that I would date. And I hate to say if they don't check the box, but if they're not checking the box, I'm going to be true to myself and just acknowledge there might be other qualities, but these aren't it. So that was a really powerful exercise. And my list was long. Mine too. I thought, oh my God, maybe that's why I'm saying. <laughs> Oh, my list is too long, right? But it was it was an interesting, fascinating exercise because you have to talk about qualities and, and, and finances and, and kindness and all kinds of things that maybe you think are going to magically happen because doesn't love conquer all. I, I think yeah, that the things, if you I wish it love, did. It these sure things doesn't. will matter. So there's research by uh, Holmberg and Holmes that sh- in, uh, I believe, 1990s, they looked at more than 400 couples when they first got married. And they found that all these couples described themselves as very happy. And then they found them two years later, all the same people. And of course, two years and- later, some people are no longer very happy because, you know, about half of all divorces that are ever going to happen, happen in the first seven years. And most of them happen in the first two years. You know this from- Right. From that's what I do. Exactly. Right. So a lot of times though, it was that people fell in love without having the skills to back it up. And Let's talk they, about that. What does that mean? Well, they don't know, for example, how to show kindness and respect, even when they've had a bad day or they disagree with one another. That's a huge one. They make assumptions about each other without clearing them up in a kind, respectful way. I will say two standards that belong on everyone's list are that this person is kind and respectful, whether the other person that they're dealing with or the animal they're dealing with has any power, no matter whether this person has had a good or a bad day, no matter what's going on in their life, their default setting is kindness and respect, which is not just a character trait. It's something we can all work on. But well, you know, someone I, is the unkind things, or disrespectful to you at the beginning of a relationship, that does not get better. About a year ago, shortly before I, I met my person, I had met this guy while I was walking my dog. And 
he seemed to be the whole enchilada. I mean, he had a PhD and a law degree. Do you know what that does for someone like me? <laughs> he was fascinating. And he, we start talking every day. He asked for my number and we were talking on the phone every night and we were just having a great time. And he asked me to be his girlfriend. And this is during pandemic. So we'd never been within six feet of each other. So we're six feet apart the whole time. And he says, I want you to be my girlfriend. I want to take you on a real date. And I said, delighted to do that. Wonderful. So we made a plan to quarantine for two weeks so that we could be within six feet of each other and a plan for him to pick me up. And he instantly started doing things that don't work in a long term relationship. And I mean, I do what I do for a living. So I see these things very clearly. Like what? what Well, like I live one street over from a very large, beautiful park. And he took his dog on a walk there. He has to drive to get to the park. And he didn't let me know he was there. A man who's just asked you to be his woman does not go within a few yards of you and not ask you to join him. Okay, but that's something that I now know after our conversations, but there might have been a time where I might have made an excuse for that. We yes. all make excuses. You know, he wanted to be alone that day. He's been close in other ways. But that to you was a red flag. It was a red flag. And and so I did, I don't know if we're ever going to do a podcast on attachment style, but it's- Yes, that's, I love that topic. Yeah, it's super important. And one of the things that I believe went wrong for some of the couples that Holmberg and Holmes studied was that some of them had an attachment style mismatch that was unworkable unless you know a lot about it, unless you self-educate and maybe get therapy about it. And so I recognize that while I have a secure attachment style, he has an avoidant one. And so you could have all the right traits, and this has happened to me, all the right traits, check all the boxes. But if your attachment styles are not the same or your understanding of a relationship is not the same, it's not going to work. Is that what you're telling us? What I'm really telling you is that People don't all have the same capacity or desire for love. That's a very powerful statement. Yeah, it's really, when, when that thought hit me, that that summarized this enormous area of research on attachment style, that people don't all have the same capacity and desire for love. I realized, oh my gosh, a huge part of this is finding someone whose capacity and desire for love matches mine. I have had an anxious attachment style and now I'm secure. Both of those types of styles have a very high capacity and desire and ability to love. Whereas people with an avoidance style do not value intimacy as much and therefore they don't put as much into it and they don't develop as much love. They're not as willing almost ever. I'm not saying that can't change, but it's probably not going to change with you. That's not the way to bet. And so I recognized this guy was doing things like all of a sudden he expected me to do half the courting. That's not a good sign. Men who are secure or even who are anxious, they want to court you. This was him throwing down the gauntlet, creating a a power struggle where there wasn't one. And I recognized what was going on. So when that happened that night, I'd been observing for about a week at this point. Also, he went to a party after we were quarantining, which meant that our date had to be put off even further. Look, a guy who really wants you, if he has to quarantine two weeks to see you, he's not going to wait four days into it and go, uh, you know what? I think I'm going to go to this thing. So, you know, you list the personality traits, right? And, and by the way, you were talking about kindness. I, I think probably one of the most common themes in people that I see whose divorce are ending is they stopped being kind to each other a long time ago. Yeah. You can't um, ever stop. And, and that's right. It is probably the, the, the most significant thing that happens to a marriage that ends it. There is a disregard for emotion. There's no more kindness. There's no more sensitivity and it will kill a relationship. Yeah. It's about these traits. So I actually asked him on the phone that night, I had observed for about a week that he was pulling back. I said, you know, I think we might've done the girlfriend thing a little quickly. I'm seeing some signs of some pullback and I'd like to talk about that. And that's what secure people do. And it's what I try to teach a lot of my non-secure clients to do is when you see something, say something, but say it kindly. Don't say you don't love me or you don't like me or you start with an I statement. I'm noticing this. I'm wondering what it means. Ask open-ended questions, be accepting, be open. So I did that. And he just lit into me. 
he took things I had told him in confidence and used them against me in the conversation. And here's that was the end of that. Oh, yeah. But but you say that as if, well, that's a foregone conclusion. Almost everyone I've ever worked with, it wouldn't have been the end. They would have tried to accommodate the person. Of course. They would have asked what's wrong with, with me. In fact, I will go so far as to say nobody I have ever worked with would have left right then. I did because what have I been doing for all these years? What was really interesting is that I found out from other people who knew him that this is how he treats women. So I had already left him. I sent him a Dear John email and said, unfortunately, the level of unkindness and disrespect in that call has made it where I can't interact with you anymore. And that makes me really sad. But basically, our work here is done. And he he responded with an even more cruel response. And I thought, good to know. Good to know. Kindness. Yeah. I know this is tough. I know it's tough because I've done it only recently. I want you to Maya Angelou, your dating scenario. When somebody shows you who they are, believe them the first time. One of my favorite expressions. You have to be kind and respectful all the way through. And when you first meet somebody, they're showing the very best they're capable of. If the very best your potential person is capable of is showing you unkindness and disrespect, the first moment they feel that they're under threat or the first moment that they've had a bad day, they are telling you who they are. Run. But the trick is, and I have learned this through our discussions and through my reading, that when you see that it will not get better and it's going to hurt for just a bit, but it is a very, very necessary tool to have because it will not get better. Yeah, you, mean, you've just yeah. touched on a, a concept that I talk about a lot with clients, which is you're in for pain either way. You know, if you stay with this person, the worst way that someone treats others is the way that you will eventually be treated by them. I, I would like to say it's a law of psychology. And so when you when you see that... You're in for pain if you leave them because at this point you are kind of attached to them, but you're in for a lot more pain if you stay because that's how you're going to get treated and life's too short. And and it is a certainty that you will not stay together. People who are unkind and disrespectful over the long haul are people who disconnect, become lonely and leave each other. You know, Dwayne, one of the first things I do when somebody comes in to see me for a divorce consultation is I say to them, don't tell me about what's happening now. Tell me your story, how you met, about your courtship, about your marriage. I would say in most cases, when you examine the courtship, there is something that connects to the reason for the divorce. There were excuses made for unkind behavior. There were excuses made for alcohol abuse, excuses made for infidelity. And when you turn a blind eye to those things early on, and we've all done it, I certainly have, not above it, it always comes back. We always go back to those original issues. They might be uh, masked for a while, but we go back there. Yeah. One of the things I want to talk about that you speak about is capacity. Can we talk about that for a minute? Because I think that what's very powerful about your work is you explain relationships or somebody not working out, not as that they're a bad person or that it's a failure. It's a capacity issue. That to me was life changing because it takes away from the feeling of rejection and it must be me. And it lets you look at clearly somebody else's capacity. Talk to me about that. Yeah, this gets back into, do they match my list? Do I match theirs? When you're on a date, don't worry about whether you match what they need. That's their job to discern that. That's not your job. Your job is to discern whether they have what you need. And you can't assess that unless you know what you need, which is why, again, this list is so important. When you're dating, Auntie Duena here is going to ask you to look at your list every time you go on a date before the date. So you can ask the hard questions, which I know we're going to get to in a minute. And after the date to write in your journal, what did you learn? So one one of the things that I I find fascinating that you write about, or we've spoken about is this idea that if you don't get butterflies immediately, doesn't mean it's not a, a, a good match, so to speak. And you've even talked to me about an example of somebody you've worked with that didn't get the butterflies immediately. And then two or three days, dates later, after they spoke for hours and hours, they did. So talk to me about chemistry and connections, because to me, a connection is if you could speak with somebody for hours, I perceive that as a connection. My experience, and I had a particular experience where that person didn't perceive that as enough of a connection to have chemistry. So that's an interesting concept to me. I think we're raised to think there's this magical chemistry that happens and sometimes it develops and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. So that is so interesting that you brought that up, Pat, because a lot of times men and women have under their must-haves that there must be powerful chemistry. And I say, so that's fine that there must be powerful chemistry eventually, but I hope you don't mean right off the bat. And many people look really 
confused or disheartened when I say that. The example you're referring to, those letters are in my second book, Love Factually for Single Parents and Those Dating Them. She allowed me to post our letters to each other, where the first letter, she's like, I don't know. He's just too small. He's not tall enough. I don't I don't feel like a petite flower when I'm with him. You know, I like talking to him, but I really didn't even want to hug him. I don't want to kiss him. I think of him more as just a friend. And what I told her was, I need you to remember that the best people don't always sparkle right away. I need you to remember that the rule is if he meets your must have to the extent you can assess them so far and you're not physically repulsed by him. Notice I didn't say you are attracted. You aren't physically repulsed. If you're neutral or simply not repulsed and he doesn't have any of your deal breakers, you got to go out with him again. That's the rule. I think men and women look at that differently, don't you? Well, for men, they know the second they like you, whether they would want to have sex with you. So from their standpoint, most of the time, most of the time, you know, nothing I say is going to apply to every single person of course every single not. time. No, there are men not. who are very, they don't get attracted to very many people. And when they do, it does grow over time because of the emotional connection. And there are other men who just know, bing, you're it or you're not as far as the physical attraction. I will say this. If a man's answer to, could I want to have sex with her is no, he need to look no further. But that's a yeah. little different than we have huge chemistry. That can still develop. With women, you know, there are women that I've worked with who they weren't repel repulsed, but just like the example I just gave, she thought he was too small. She wasn't really attracted to him. She didn't want to kiss him. She just kind of thought of him more as a friend. I have a letter in my book that was written two months after that one. She wrote it two months after where she said, I've never felt butterflies like this before. It's great. I love that. Don't rush to judgment on this. Whether you're male or female, when you start getting to know someone, you will either start liking them more and more or less and less. Wait right. until your gut tips one way or the other, which it will. You can trust yourself on this. It will tell you either, wow, I want more and more of you or eh, I want less and less. And when it speaks clearly, that's the time to, to cut bait. One of the other things that you write about and we've spoken about is asking the hard questions. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about that because it seems so, I don't know unromantic as you're courting to ask those hard questions. What do you mean by that? This gets back to something that we started talking about really early in this interview. You asked me, you know, does this kind of ruin your romance for dating, knowing all these facts about relationships? I, by the way, will not date ever again until I do this. And I now do that when I date. So preaching to the converted, as they say, because I think <laughs> it's brilliant. I think it's the most brilliant tool I've ever heard. It just clears out so much. Yeah. Well, I just want to preface this with, just like learning all about digestion didn't ruin my enjoyment of a meal, knowing all about the process of successfully partnering will not ruin your enjoyment of falling in love. It won't. What it will do is it will eliminate people who can never give you what you need. And therefore it will end a lot of the hurt in your life. It's not going to end the love. It's going to make it much more likely. And that's what I want for everyone. So the hard questions. We're going back yeah. to the list. Are you getting the impression the list is important? <laughs> but when you ask the questions is when you're really being honest with yourself that you're prepared for the answers. Yes. And there's two aspects of that. One is, well, three, what questions are you going to ask? How are you going to ask them? And how are you going to answer them? Because anything you ask is fair game. Let's start with anything you ask can ask is fair game. Yeah. What's too much to ask? What's too little to ask as you're getting to know somebody? So I want you all to have that list and go over your list and make sure that you come up with ways to assess that. For example, uh, is this person kind and respectful? Well, you can't ask people, are you kind and respectful? Everybody will say yes to that because it's socially desirable to say yes. And people want to think the best about themselves. You know, in research, 90% of drivers think they're better drivers than 90% of drivers. So you can't ask people that and get a real answer, but you can look at the their behavior. On the other hand, there are some things that you just have to ask about. So, because you're not going to talk them into anything or out of anything, particularly at a certain age. Well, I'm pretty convinced you're really just not going to talk them into or out of anything anyhow. But yeah, I, I think that's really a smart thing to do. I think people are naive in that regard and they think they could. There are certain things that should be deal breakers and you should know them up front. Yeah, exactly. So as humorous Dave Barry said, famously, if they're nice to you, but rude to the waiter, they're not a nice person. That's how you assess kindness and respect. Look at their behavior. Look, especially at what they say about former partners, because the worst way they talk about any uh -huh. former partners, how you're going to be talked about. And the question there is, 
if your ex were here right now, what would they say was the reason the relationship ended? You're listening for the answer because they'll almost always tell you the, the true answer if you frame it that way. But you're also listening for what they say about their ex and how they say it. So one of my deal breakers, and I, I've shared this with you, is how they have resolved conflict in the past. And particularly since I'm a divorce lawyer, I don't want to hear about your divorce problems or your anger or your alimony obligations. And if you ask somebody about that, that is a very revealing question because if they're still angry or they're still talking about how you know they were taken advantage of, that for me is a deal breaker. Process it, figure it out, go to therapy, but I'm not going to sit here and talk about it. So that's a perfect example of an upfront question. It's a fine line. You're trying to ask very meaningful questions in a very kind way. So I'll give you an example from my own search. Please. Uh, my boyfriend and I live a couple hours apart. And of course, we knew this from the first meeting. And I have met so many people in my line of work who they lived X amount of distance apart and they didn't have the discussion early and years go by and they break up because they live far apart and it's not resolvable for them. So I was really enjoying talking to this guy. And I said, Wow, I'm really enjoying talking to you. And that actually means that I have to ask you kind of a hard question because I don't want to like you even more if this isn't workable. There's no point in it. I'm just wondering if this were to work out, would you be willing to move where I am? Because I really like it here. I That's said, a tough question to ask while you're still talking on the phone and you haven't been involved yet. Oh, it really. was the first conversation. His response obviously was yes, because you're well, still Well, his response was, of course, you do what you need to for the person that you love. Well, I, I think secure people talk about what they need and talk about what they feel. What they I have do. learned in, is that I'm a secure personality type. And I've learned that I do talk about what I need and what I feel and that I have met people who are incapable of doing that or they don't know themselves. Again, doesn't make them bad and me good. It just makes the capacity different. I, I think all of your tools and tips, if I could convey something to the audience, because I've, I've gone through this process myself, I think that these tools and tips are a great way to filter out people who aren't good mates and to really be self-respecting. Because sometimes in the dating process, we make excuses for people. We're not being self-respecting. What I've learned, and I'm continuing to learn, is that if you do know who you are, what you want and you could not accept people not wanting you as rejection, you will ultimately connect with somebody who is an appropriate match for you. But you got to put the work in and, and you have to put the time in. And that is a little bit, that's another conversation, but that's, it's work. It is work, but you know, there's no work you're ever going to do that has the capacity to make you happy in so many ways. I wanted to go back to saying it's work. I love to get to know people. I don't love to date because there's not, I'm not interested in a wide spectrum of people, but it really could be fun to get to know different people. You know, through this dating journey, which I've only been on for a short number of years, I've gotten to learn about people. I've gotten to learn about topics. I've gotten to see different people uh, in different ways. So it's expanded my world. And that's been a good part of it, even if it hasn't been somebody who's been a connection yes. uh, for a long term. Yeah, I love your attitude. I tell people, try to look at it like a field trip. You might never see this person again. Expect that this probably isn't your person, but that it could be. Have a positive attitude. Right. People often say, well, I had this long, bad relationship, but I learned so much from it. Here's what I want for you. I want you to have short dates that you learn so much from and a single Absolutely. long relationship that sustains you. There is someone out there who is looking for you, specifically for what you have to offer and the constellation Absolutely. of who you are. There is someone who is looking for you. And here's the thing. If you are mucking around with the wrong person, they don't get to find you and you don't get to have them. And my mother used to say, you know, there's a lid for every pot. And I believe that. I think you have to go through the process though. You're not going to walk into them on the street, you know, the old way we used to look at things. I think that your approach, the scientific approach is well-reasoned, logical. And I don't want for a minute our audience to think that it diminishes passion, love, and emotion. In fact, it enhances it. It absolutely does. If you do the hard work on the front end of changing your mindset, 
changing the way that you date, both in terms of where and how you're meeting people and how you interview them, because it is an interview early on and finding out the important things earlier rather than later, you wind up with joy. You wind up with passion. You wind up being able to fully give yourself to someone where it will actually work. Well, what I'm looking forward to, Dwayne, is hopefully in our next conversation, we're going to talk about attachment styles, how to identify attachment styles, how to know your own attachment style, and how that's a simple process to go through to really see if you're a good match. And I look forward to exploring that on our next conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Please give us a five-star rating and leave a review so more people can listen in to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito. 